Um, I am happy to welcome everyone here for this exciting uh, presentation on advances for differentiated thyroid cancers. Um, I'd like to introduce our guest. His name is Andrew Yanakakis. He's an endocrinologist at the University of California, Los Angeles School of Medicine in Torrance, California. He's an expert in thyroid disorders with particular expertise and advanced thyroid cancer and Graves disease, including thyroid eye disease. Dr. Yanakakis, his clinical research focuses on novel and cutting edge therapeutic clinical trials for advanced thyroid cancer. In addition, he is investigating the development of the liquid biopsy for thyroid cancer diagnosis, as well as the development of no novel ass assays for thyroid and th thyroid antibody testing. He directs the thyroid clinic and the thyroid oncology clinic at Harbor UCLA, where he also serves as fellowship training program director. He is also a FICA medical advisor. Welcome Dr. Yanakakis, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Roberta, for that kind introduction and welcome to everybody who's joined us this afternoon, later on the East Coast, uh, a little earlier on the West Coast. Um, so I will jump right in. Um, the presentation's a little bit long, so I'm going to try to speed up in some parts where I think uh, maybe we can do that and then um, hopefully get through most of it and leave time for questions. Uh, Roberta, as um, she may have mentioned, will try to batch her questions, so please feel free to submit them during the presentation. She'll batch questions and hopefully um, we can have an efficient question and answer session at the end. All right, so as uh, Roberta mentioned, we're going to speak about targeted therapies for advanced differentiated thyroid cancer today. We'll touch very little, just really mentioned medullary, but we're focused on DTC. Um, and a, a part of the presentation will focus on patient expectations from the therapy um, or from clinical trials. As a matter of disclosures, I am uh, involved in clinical trials and or as an advisor, uh, advisory board member and consultant um, uh, regarding multiple clinical trials, organizations and sponsors. But we won't be talking um, about uh, that today, although some of the drugs that we will be mentioning, I have been involved in their development or involved as an advisory board member. As a matter of an outline, we're going to touch first on general cancer therapy um, and where we've come over the last 20 to 30 years, where we were and, and where we've come, and then focus in on um, the advances throughout um, the field of cancer, um, specifically on thyroid cancer. Before we do that, we'll talk about thyroid cancer and its epidemiology, the types of thyroid cancer, what causes thyroid cancer, and then jump into um, targeted therapies for thyroid cancer, immunotherapy as it pertains to thyroid cancer, as well as the development of combination therapies, both in thyroid cancer um, as well as in other cancers. And then at the end, hopefully have some time to touch on future cancer therapies that are in development and then have a summary and discussion um, with a question and answer session. So a snapshot, as I mentioned, cancer care has come a long way over the last 20 years. 20 years ago, um, cancer was primarily treated based on histology. So that means how the cells and the tumors looked um, in an organizational way under the microscope to the pathologist, the location of the tumor and the size of the tumor. There were a few biomarkers um, that were used in other cancers, similar to, we've been fortunate in thyroid cancer to have thyroglobulin as a biomarker um, all these years, but there were a few biomarkers when it came to other thyroid cancers. And there were roughly 200 um, fewer treatments um, than we have today in general um, in the care of oncology patients. There were three basic treatment modalities, chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. And um, that's where the buck stopped. And there were limited supportive care options. Now, over the last um, 20 to 30 years, we've begun to learn about the molecular signatures and drivers 
um, in the genetic material of the tumors. So um, we can see on this um, screen different tumors on the y-axis and a, a host of different mutations on the x-axis. And all I want you to, to, to notice in addition to the number of um, different markers, and there are many more than, are, that are, than what is depicted on the screen, um, how if you take, thyroid cancer is not on this list, unfortunately, but if you take a cancer, let's say ovarian cancer or liver cancer, and you go across the line, you can see that, that each individual cancer can have fewer or more mutations. And then going up the y-axis, how, for example, you can take a mutation like an HRAS mutation, which is present in thyroid cancer, and see that there are multiple tumor types that share the same mutation. And these mutations, in, a different, in addition to, so an, an understanding of the, um, the molecular underpinnings of the different tumors, we've also understood the pathophysiology of cancer, um, and we've developed multiple different uh, approaches to attacking the, the way cancer grows, invades, spreads. And so on this screen, we're going to focus um, on VEGF signaling, where uh, we're currently using VEGF kinase inhibitors in thyroid cancer, as well as in other cancers, to combat the blood um, flow, the development of blood vessels that the tumor promotes to help its growth. And so this shutting off of this VEGF kinase signaling turns off the blood supply to the tumor and is one way to inhibit its growth. Um, the tumors develop their own kind of um, uh, growth promoting hormone um, secretion and they're able to turn on growth pathways on their own out of the normal control. And so um, therapies like EGFR inhibitors, they don't pertain specifically to thyroid cancer. Um, but there are other inhibitors that we'll talk about that um, inhibit growth promoting patterns, uh, pathways that thyroid cancers and other cancers use to develop and grow. And then we're also gonna focus on the immune system. So as we'll talk about, tumors have figured out a way to turn off our immune system so that they are not attacked. And um, there's a new um, a way to now um, put a monkey wrench into this immune avoidance that the tumors are setting up called checkpoint inhibitors, where we can block the immune system, block the cancer from turning off the immune system and actually turn on the immune system to attack the tumor. And so these are three, the three pathways that are relevant to thyroid cancer, three approaches of attack that we'll um, spend more time on late in a little bit. So everything started in the late 90s and early 2000s. Trastuzumab um, was one of the first kinase inhibitors um, that were developed here at UCLA um, to treat HER2 positive breast cancer and imatinib um, was uh, introduced shortly after that and was used in multiple different um, cancer types. And so we began to classify and treat tumors based on these molecular signatures. And over the past 20 to 25 years, over 100 drugs have been approved by the FDA that target specific mutations. In addition, as I've mentioned, there has been this um, rise of immunotherapy. And immunotherapy, which we'll talk about more later on as it pertains to thyroid cancer, um, is kind of the blanket that covers all cancers. Um, it's, um, most cancers have figured out this way to turn off our immune system. And these checkpoint inhibitors that have been developed um, 
turn on our immune system to attack all cancers. Um, and while thyroid, can thyroid cancer was not on this list, um, thyroid cancer is going to be on this list because we recently completed uh, a trial using immunotherapy in advanced thyroid cancer and it was successful. Um, and so thyroid will soon be added to this list and we'll talk more about that later. So um, as I mentioned, um, the, the approvals um, by year have been uh, of drugs approved by the FDA have gone from uh, a paucity of new drugs to an explosion of multiple drugs attacking multiple pathways that are common, as I've mentioned, to multiple tumors. So when one drug and one target are identified and tested, um, either multiple tumor types are tested at the same time, um, or um, when it's su successful to treat one drug with a particular mutation, that opens the path to testing that same drug on other tumors that share that same mutation with the hope that the drug will be equally effective. And this, uh, these developments that I've mentioned to this point have had this ultimate impact of decreasing overall cancer mortality over the past 20 to 30 years and increasing cancer survival as we can see here in this graph. So now getting more specific and, and being more specific with regard to thyroid cancer. There are approximately 50,000 new cases per year um, of thyroid cancer in the US. Women are affected at approximately a four to one ratio compared to men. And in women, it's the fifth most common cancer um, at approximately um, 37,000 cases per year. Thyroid cancer deaths are fortunately in the single digit and low single digit thousands, only approximately 2000 per year. The female to male ratio is approximately one, however, um, suggesting that men, when they do develop thyroid cancer, it's more aggressive and more likely to deal to, to um, lead to death. Um, so more common in women, but an equal um, rate of death. The difference between the number of cases, approximately 50,000 per year, and fortunately only approximately 2,000 deaths, leads to a lot of patients, um, like many of you I anticipate um, at this conference, who are living uh, with their disease and either monitoring it or undergoing active therapy. And there are approximately 600,000 patients in the US um, living, um, following, and or treating their disease. Approximately 5% uh, will be radioiodine refractory, so radioiodine no longer works, and um, metastatic, um, either locally in the neck or at distant sites, such as the lung, bones, liver, et cetera, making, um, uh, creating a number of approximately 30,000 patients with radioiodine refractory metastatic disease. In general, we follow um, our cancer, our uh, thyroid cancer patients with um, ultrasound, CT scans, and thyroglobulin um, testing. And um, when we talk about um, thyroid cancer, again, we will focus on differentiated thyroid cancer um, and not speak much about medullary thyroid cancer. 80 to 85% are papillary thyroid cancer. And as I mentioned earlier, that is based on the histologic presentation of the tumor versus follicular. And we'll see what that looks like, what both look like um, to the pathologist under the microscope. The majority, again, papillary, a minority are follicular. Overall long-term survival is good with over 90% um, of early stage um, surviving uh, long-term. However, 10 to 30% um, experience progression, recurrence, or distant metastases. And the main focus um, of our efforts um, in this talk um, are how to deal with those patients um, that don't do well initially and need additional therapy beyond 
our surgery and our radioactive iodine. Um, we won't um, speak much about anaplastic thyroid cancer, um, but fortunately only a small percentage of thyroid cancers are anaplastic thyroid cancers. However, um, most anaplastic cancers are thought to develop from more well-differentiated papillary or follicular and over time develop into anaplastic thyroid cancer. Unfortunately, anaplastic thyroid cancer is rapidly growing and has a poor survival, although there have been great strides made in the treatment of anaplastic thyroid cancer. And I'll show you some clinical data later on in the talk that is very encouraging. So as I mentioned, this is a, a, a micrograph of papillary thyroid cancer, and it's called papillary because of these papillae that uh, we can see versus follicular thyroid cancer, which remains organized in these follicles, these three-dimensional, um, we're cutting them here, so we're seeing them in two dimensions, but these are three-dimensional balls or spheres with, um, a, with the thyroglobulin in the middle and the cells outlining the surface of the sphere. So this is why we call follicular thyroid cancer follicular um, versus papillary. And here we can see this follicular cancer invading into um, the surface um, of um, its own capsule or through the thyroid. And as I mentioned, both of these types of well-differentiated thyroid cancer can over time develop into more aggressive, less um, differentiated tumor. And in this micrograph, we're seeing a follicular thyroid cancer develop into, uh, that, that has come from something that looks like this to something that looks like this to something that ultimately transitions into something that looks more like this, which is anaplastic. So what is the cause of thyroid cancer? So as I mentioned earlier, um, there are growth pathways that are common to all cells that cells use to grow and develop and duplicate. But these pathways are hijacked by mutations um, either at the surface um, where we have receptors or in the middle of the cell where we have um, different proteins that participate in the transfer of the growth signal from the environment outside the cell to the surface of the cell to the nucleus. So there are growth factors like growth hormone, for example, which float around the blood, will attach at a specific receptor, will activate that receptor. That receptor will lead to activation of these intracellular proteins and ultimately lead to the signal going to the nucleus telling the cell to duplicate and replicate. And so there can be mutations at the surface level, at the receptor level, or at any one of these intracellular signaling protein levels, which cause these pathways to be const constantly turned on without any regulation. Uh, meanwhile, in normal growth and development, these pathways are regulated and have a, a, a physiologic role. So all along the way here, we can have these um, kinase um, receptor mutations. We can have mutations of RAS or BRAF or MEC or AKT or mTOR, and drugs have been developed to target these pathways um, as they are common to the development of tumors, both thyroid cancer as well as other cancers. Now, how does this um, transition happen from the normal follicular cell, the normal thyroid cell, to a follicular thyroid cancer versus a papillary thyroid cancer, and then to a more dedifferentiated radioiodine refractory cancer? and then ultimately to an anaplastic cancer. And what we found is that depending on the mutation, whether for example, you have a RAS mutation or a BRAF mutation, you develop along the pathway to a papillary thyroid cancer, 
versus a follicular cancer. And then you have these more common to multiple tumors mutations that when added on top of the original, what we call driver mutations, you then begin to have a more dedifferentiated tumor that no longer makes thyroglobulin, that no longer takes up iodine and is dedifferentiated. And then additional mutations, again, common to multiple different cancer types, oops, sorry, um, like the P53 or beta catenin, which drive that tumor to become even more dedifferentiated and aggressive to, and leading to the development of anaplastic thyroid cancer. And sometimes patients will present right from the get-go with anaplastic thyroid cancer, and sometimes we'll see patients progress th slowly through this pathway and go from a more well-differentiated to poorly differentiated to what we call anaplastic transformation. Now back to these molecular alterations that we talked about in general for all cancers, um, the same um, development and discovery has occurred in thyroid cancer, where back in the 90s, we only knew about two types of molecular alterations and could only identify a mutation in approximately 25% of thyroid cancers, where we've identified many more. Um, and in 2014, we were up to approximately 90% of thyroid cancers, um, we, we being able to identify at least one mutation and at the present time, we're very close to 100%, being able to identify at least one mutation in close to 100% of um, thyroid cancers. In addition, as we've learned about the molecular signatures that underlie the, um, the development of these thyroid cancers, we've learned that while this big group, this 84% of all thyroid cancers, which we call papillary because of the way they look to the pathologist under the microscope, we've now learned to break them up into multiple different types of papillary, depending on the mutations that they harbor. And some um, have a more aggressive, and we expect a more aggressive um, course from them, for example, um, the tall cell BRAF positive, and some are thought to be very benign and almost non-malignant, like this NIFT-P. So we've taken this bigger pie where we know patients, when we use the same therapies, don't all respond the same way and are now learning that there are multiple pieces to that pie, and these are all, all not um, the same tumors and won't all respond, not all have the same biologic course and not all respond to the same therapies. So moving on now to therapeutics and how we've taken all this knowledge about the different subtypes based on the mutations and begun to target some of these mutations to um, offer additional therapies to patients with differentiated thyroid cancer. So as I mentioned earlier, traditionally differentiated thyroid cancer involved surgery, plus minus, so removal of the thyroid, plus minus a lymph node dissection, levothyroxine suppression to suppress TSH, which is a growth factor for thyroid tumors and thyroid cancer cells that are left behind, and then radioactive iodine. And this is a picture of a radioactive iodine scan showing metastases uh, in the lungs and other places in a patient with thyroid cancer. Unfortunately, however, despite our best efforts um, with radioactive iodine and levothyroxine suppression and surgery, approximately 15% of patients develop distant METs, and a third of those um, develop what we call radioiodine refractory disease, where the radioactive iodine no longer works. And we know um, from this work from um, Europe and Dr. Schlumberger and Durante from about 15 years ago now, that um, we, hear, we see survival here on the y-axis and years after the, the discovery of metastasis on the, um, the y-axis, um, 
we see that patients who take up radar of iodine in their metastases um, do much better compared to patients who are RAI refractory. In fact, at five years, um, approximately um, 45 to 50% um, survival um, can be expected of patients who are REI refractory, and out to 10 years, that drops down to approximately 10%. So this was clearly, um, there was clearly a need here for us to develop therapies for patients who had become metastatic and REI refractory. And up until only five to seven years ago, the only FDA-approved therapy for radioactive iodine refractory um, thyroid cancer was doxorubicin. It really didn't work very, very well. It had lots of toxicity and pretty much it was never used. But since 1972, um, that was the only approval we had. And so we were clearly had this therapeutic dilemma and our hands were tied um, until more recently. So moving on now to the newer and developed targeted therapies that have been developed and approved over the past five to seven years. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we know that the tumors would make these blood vessel growth factors so that they could stimulate the growth of these vessels from the main blood supplies of the patient to go and feed um, the tumor and allow it to grow. We also knew about these intracellular growth pathways that have been turned on by different mutations leading to um, accelerated uncontrolled cell growth. So, so the efforts began to attack both the, the cancer cell itself as well as the growth of this blood supply which was allowing um, the growth uh, of the tumor by supplying it um, with growth factors and nutrients. And so multiple drugs, as we can see here on this schematic, were developed. We'll start by looking first at the vascular endothelial cell, um, which would be the target of the vascular growth factors, which would lead to multiplication of this vascular cell and the development of blood vessels to feed the tumor. And we can see that there are multiple um, drugs hitting this VEGF receptor, um, which is the primary um, target, and then additional um, growth factors that are hit by some addition, but by some other drugs that affect um, the growth pathways of the vascular endothelial cell. And, and now turning to the actual tumor cell, there are multiple receptors, cell surface receptors, and these intracellular signaling proteins that we discussed that are targeted by different drugs. And we can see that um, many of these drugs will hit multiple mutations. So we can see that lenvatinib, for example, hits the RET receptor and the EGFR receptor, um, as well as the um, VEGF receptor um, on the vascular endothelial cells. And, Serafinib, which we'll also talk about, hits multiple kinases, the BRAF kinase and the RET receptor, um, and also the VEGF receptor kinase. So um, the initial drugs that were developed hit multiple um, aspects of tumor growth and development, but also because of that um, had side effects because they were hitting multiple pathways and remember these pathways are also used by normal cells to grow and develop. So we'll, we'll now talk about an illustrative thyroid cancer patient. So MB um, was a patient who came to see me. She was 55 years old. In August of 2006, she was diagnosed with a widely invasive follicular cancer, cancer herthal cell subtype. She had a thyroidectomy and received 200 millicuries of radioactive iodine. This was her staging, stage three, no distant mets, um, but a large tumor with lymph nodes in the neck. Approximately a year later, she had a recurrence in the neck. She had additional surgery and received external beam 
radiotherapy. That worked for about two and a half years, at which point in 2010, she had another recurrence um, in the left neck. Um, she um, also suffered from left vocal cord paresis um, from the tumor. She had an I-123 scan to see if radioactive iodine could be used again, but it was negative. So um, in May of 2010, she had an aggressive surgical procedure that in order to get rid of the tumor uh, as best they could, she agreed to a laryngectomy, so removal of a vocal cord box, a partial pharyngectomy, so parts of the back of her throat were removed, and then a right and left lymph node resection. And unfortunately, only about a year and a half later, she had another recurrence and progression. At that point, she was offered additional um, surgery, um, but thought that was futile and made the decision on her own to go seek um, options in the clinical trial arena. And at the time, um, we were participating in the, in the clinical, um, in, in the phase three clinical study with lenvatinib. And so she came to see us in um, the fall, um, I believe this is 2011. And um, as we can see, this is a PET scan. So she had um, these tumors in the back of her throat um, that were quite large. One was five centimeters, one was three centimeters. And when she came to see us in the fall in October, um, and we compared her scans from July to October, you can easily see just in those three months that the tumor was growing pretty rapidly. And so what now? Fortunately, as I mentioned, um, in the clinical trial setting at the time, we were able to offer her lenvatinib. Um, this is the front page of the New England Journal of Medicine article um, um, showing the results of the phase three um, lenvatinib uh, clinical trial. And very quickly, um, her tumor disappeared, as you can see here. Now, she was very, very fortunate. Um, she had no side effects from the medication. And also, there were four patients with complete remission out of um, 260, and she was one of the four. So her disease um, resolved completely, but she was in the minority, um, both with absence of side effects um, and efficacy of the medication. But so I'm showing you here the comparison between 2011 and 2013, um, but this disappearance actually occurred within months. And she was able to stay on the medication for nearly eight to nine years, at which point she began to have some small amount of recurrence in the back of her throat. And that was treated with external beam radiation. And she's currently being followed still um, without any recurrence and actually off of systemic therapy. So a, a success story, um, one of many, um, but almost the ideal success story. So uh, again, she was in the minority, but um, when we look at the lenvatinib phase three trial um, and we look at partial remission as well as complete remission, nearly 65% of patients had a partial remission plus these four patients, 1.5% who had a complete remission. And since all patients um, were um, who were enrolled in the trial were progressing, when you add on those who we were able to stabilize their disease, in addition to the PR and CR, um, the, the clinical benefit rate was over 80 to 90%. Similarly, serafinib, uh, which predated um, the approval of lenvatinib by approximately um, two years. Um, also, it was the first drug to be approved for thyroid cancer, also um, showed a progression-free survival benefit um, over um, the placebo patients um, and was the first drug that we had available. And um, I have a patient who presented with unresectable 
neck disease. The surgeons could not do surgery and her cancer is still in place. And she went on serafinib, has been on serafinib now um, for seven or so years. And comes, she had a trach placed. The trach was ultimately removed. She comes to clinic, came this past week. Um, she's now approaching or just into her 70s um, and doing well um, on serafinib with no side effects. And again, not even post-surgery or radioactive iodine, um, just external beam radiotherapy and her tumor still in place. Now, when we look at um, and we focus on um, patients who are responders, and this pertains to lenvatinib, so those that the four that achieved chronic remission and those with partial remission, and we look to see um, how long they benefit with progression-free survival, so um, moving along without their disease progressing. I'm going to go back one slide and say that the progression-free survival in the whole group was 18.3 months. But when you focus on the patients that were responders, so either PR or CR, and to obtain PR, your disease had to shrink by 30%. When you focus on this group um, you, and you look at progression-free survival in that subgroup, that was out to 33 months. So nearly three years of progression-free survival in patients who respond with either a CR or a PR, which I'll go back again, makes up 66, 67% of that trial um, of, of those um, patients on the trial. So a pretty good bang for your buck for patients who are progressing radioactive iodine refractory, 65 to 70% of patients um, will have their disease controlled for out to um, nearly three years. Um, and we know pretty quickly, usually over the first two to four months, two to six months, um, who will be a responder. So as I mentioned, both of these drugs are approved. Um, they're effective. They're oral therapies taken at home. You don't have to come to the hospital for infusions. Um, they do have side effects that are usually manageable with dose adjustments and symptom-directed therapy. Uh, however, they do have serious side effects, so one needs to have experience um, with prescribing these drugs and knowing what to look for um, and selecting patients um, and drugs appropriately with close monitoring and management by a multidisciplinary team. Um, touching on um, the adverse effects, which are real, um, this is a picture of hand-foot syndrome, um, which is an inflammatory red and scaly painful condition that can occur in both the hands and the feet. Um, occurs both with lenvatinib and serafinib, although more commonly with serafinib. And then there are other toxicities um, that are uh, more manageable, such as nausea, diarrhea, fatigue, um, but these side effects can interfere with the quality of life. Um, but then there are the more serious um, side effects, such as fistula formation, um, bowel rupture, um, bleeding within the tumor that um, need to be um, uh, predicted if possible and not starting the patient on these therapies and or monitored for and addressed quickly um, and not missed. This is a list of side effects for both drugs. I won't go into this um, in detail. So um, who, when, and why to treat? So first of all, um, we'd like this, and ideally this should be part of a multidisciplinary team, including an endocrinologist and an oncologist, um, a radiation oncologist who can perform external beam radiotherapy, um, and um, a surgeon who can um, provide additional surgical um, intervention as well as your nuclear medicine specialist. So beginning with the WHO, we want to treat patients who are with the systemic therapy, who are radioactive iodine refractory, who have progressing disease and or who are symptomatic. The progressive disease is determined initially, is determined by using these RESIST criteria, 
which is a common set of criteria that have been developed. So when we communicate with each other, both um, physician to physician, but also to our patients, um, this stands for response evaluation criteria in solid tumors. And it's used for all solid tumors. Um, you begin by having a measurable lesion and then um, following progression. And progressive disease is a 20% increase of this measurable disease after a year or the development of new disease. So to qualify for progressive disease, um, someone has to have measurable disease that we can follow and then show that it's progressed or that new disease has developed over a year. So patients with progressive disease and or symptomatic disease and definitely radioactive iodine refractory disease. So that's the who. Now the when. The when remains um, a problem because we know that patients don't all progress at the same rate. And this is a schematic, it's not based on data, showing patients who are radioactive iodine refractory and some um, do well and then start to progress very quickly. Some do well and progress very slowly and stay stable for the longest time and some are in between. And so it's been challenging to decide when to begin therapy. These treatments are not a cure, they control the disease and they have side effects that can interfere with patient lifestyle. And they may have long-term side effects that we're not aware of. So we certainly don't wanna start systemic therapy on a patient like this, who's not progressing. We certainly don't wanna put a, a patient who's not progressing on a medication that will stabilize or control disease when it's not progressing. And we'd like to um, start therapy as quickly as possible and predict someone who's growing um, uh, such as this very rapidly. So we're still not sure about the, the, when the perfect timing is. There has been some information that has come out in the literature that some people use, some uh, practitioners use that has to do with the doubling time of thyroglobulin. And there has also been some tumor doubling time where lung lesions and how quickly they, they double have been used to, um, to time um, the initiation of therapy. Both are still experimental and in the process of being incorporated, um, they may be incorporated into our standard of practice in the future, but not yet. Also to try to get at this issue of treatment timing, um, Bayer has um, um, just completed this RIFTOS trial, which is a non-interventional study assessing um, the use of multi-kinase treatment in patients with radioactive iodine refractory disease. Uh, essentially, there were two groups that both qualified to initiate therapy. Some patients decided to wait and not begin therapy immediately. Some decided to go on therapy immediately. And the results are just in and we're looking at the data um, and hopefully we'll have some information um, that will help us decide on the ideal treatment timing. Now, why or why not start therapy? Um, multi-kinase inhibitor therapy has been primarily associated with progression-free survival, not overall survival. So um, ideally, we'd like to have an, an impact on overall survival. Um, I won't go into the reasons why this is, but it does to a certain degree have to do with the way uh, the, the, um, the ethicalness of um, control groups and um, um, patients going on alternative therapies once they've progressed on one therapy. So it, so it may not um, impact overall survival, although there's some data uh, to suggest that it does. Multi-kinase inhibitor therapy is not curative. Multi-kinase inhibitor therapy may cause side effects and impact the quality of life. So we really want to try to get the timing um, and be certain that we need to start therapy before we do. And then side effects are often manageable with dose reductions and dose holds, but can also be severe and life-threatening. Now, moving on to the, the newer drugs and the, the progress in the field, 
and where we are now with over the past year um, and, and couple of years, um, specifically targeted therapy, which is not like the multi-kinase inhibitors, which hit multiple pathways and have side effects, but hits specific mutations and has fewer side effects with similar efficacy. So to get to that point, we see a multi-kinase inhibitor. This is a, a kinase tree. So the different kinases, multiple different kinases coming kind of from the same, um, the, the same root um, are shown here. And we have a drug that's a multi-kinase inhibitor that hits multiple different kinases in the same family versus a more specific kinase inhibitor that hits only a few, hits the targeted one and then a few others. So that's what we're, we're that's where the field is moving to try and maintain efficacy, but minimize side effects. And as I mentioned, multiple um, targets are common across different cancers, and I'll try to speed along through this. So this um, is a, an abstract looking at RET fusions and all the different cancers that can express RET fusions with thyroid cancers um, being approximately 10 to 20%. Um, a recent study showed that approximately 7% of well-differentiated thyroid cancers can have RET fusions. And we recently, over the past year, had two drugs approved um, for the, the, the treatment of RET-driven um, cancers, including medullary, um, but also including um, well-differentiated thyroid cancers that are driven by these RET mutations. And this is one of those two drugs, Blue 667. Um, there's also a Loxolily drug, um, again, looking at this um, kinome tree. Um, you have this specificity where this RET kinase inhibitor is hitting the target with very little um, outside of that target. And um, this drug was recently approved, as was uh, another drug by Loxo and Lilly. Similarly, um, over the past uh, few years, there have been these um, drugs called NTREC um, fusion um, inhibitors. And um, unfortunately, in this study, 9% of um, uh, the patients studied had thyroid cancer. Um, there are approved drugs. Should a patient have an NTREC fusion? Um, again, it's specifically targeted, um, low side effect profile, good efficacy, low side effect profile, good efficacy, but only approximately 1% or less of well-differentiated tumors will have an NTREC fusion. I will skip this. We'll talk now quickly about immunotherapy. So as I've mentioned, the tumor cell, uh, well, when, when our our immune system, our T cells, interact with the normal cells in the body. They use different molecules on the surface to communicate. And so the T cell has this PD-1 uh, receptor, and it looks for this PD-L1-2 receptor on the surface of a cell. And if it sees it, it says, hey, you're one of us. I'm not going to attack you. And the tumors have figured out a way to express this PD-L1 and trick the T cell in the immune system that shows up to attack it. And so what these checkpoint inhibitors are doing, there are these antibodies that go and they interfere with this connection here and don't allow this bridge to form and allow the T cells to remain activated and attack the tumor. And that goes for all tumors. Um, and as I said, most recently also for thyroid cancer tumors. The Nobel Prize was awarded to these two um, scientists and physicians in 2018 for the co-development of immunotherapy. And that has led to these combination trials. Not only are we combining multiple drugs that are hitting multiple pathways, but now we're also adding immunotherapy on top of that. Because immunotherapy is that blanket that just turns on our immune system against all different types of tumors. So you can combine two immunotherapies together. You can combine immunotherapy with radiotherapy, with targeted therapy, or with chemotherapy. 
And that has led to a lot of um, clinical trials, um, combination clinical trials over the past few years. And one of those combination trials was just completed in thyroid cancer. Before I get to that, this is an example of some early clinical data in anaplastic thyroid cancer that's BRAF positive, that has the BRAF mutation. And here we're treating with a BRAF and a MEK inhibitor, as well as adding immunotherapy on top of that. And these are two separate studies. And we can see three patients with their the tumors before and then after, eight weeks after therapy. And you can see the clear shrinkage of the tumor on this combined therapy. In the picture on the right, we go from individual patients from left to right. All of this black stuff is tumor before and after three months, before and after five months, before and after one month, et cetera, et cetera. So anaplastic thyroid cancer, which has this terrible prognosis that I mentioned earlier, if it has a BRAF mutation, treatment with this combination therapy has led to these remarkable initial um, improvements and effects. I will, uh, this is another type of combined therapy, combining two different types of immune approaches and future therapies. Um, we are working on tumor redifferentiation. What we've learned is that um, patients um, with these tumors who have the BRAF mutation, when this pathway is activated, the iodine concentrating ability of the tumor cells is hampered. And so that leads to the radioactive iodine refractoriness. And if we block the activation of this pathway, either with a BRAF inhibitor or a MEK inhibitor, we can increase the uptake of iodine by the tumors and reuse um, the radioactive iodine. And so here's an example of tumors and thyroid cancer tumors taking up some of them taking up iodine and then receiving this solumetinib treatment, blocking the pathway and the uptake of iodine afterwards. This, these are, there are multiple clinical trials working on this and hopefully there'll be, there'll be future developments. Dr. Yanakakis, I wanna let you know we have about five minutes left. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over these combination um, therapeutic approaches as well as this interesting therapeutic approach which involves immunotherapy and just summarize. So the current ATA guidelines are still from 2015, but they're being updated and will be out soon. But um, the recommendation is that kinase inhibitor therapy should be considered in radioactive iodine refractory, metastatic, progressive, symptomatic, or imminently threatening disease. Patients need to be counseled on the risks and benefits and clinical trials should be considered when available. All things that we've kind of discussed throughout the talk. With regard to entering into clinical trials, there are positives and negatives. I won't belabor the point. Um, clinical trials may be the only option available. Um, there are, which would be, which, which would present a great opportunity. There are negatives in that there really is no guarantee for benefit and there may be potential harm. And there are restrictions to a clinical trial. Physicians and patients need to follow uh, an algorithm and a guide. New therapies that are coming, as I mentioned, we just uh, completed this lenvatinib plus pembrolizumab trial. So lenvatinib plus an immune checkpoint inhibitor and data has been submitted for publication. Um, this redifferentiation therapy, there are ongoing clinical trials to try and be able to use radioactive iodine again. Um, there are these highly selected recently approved uh, RET, NTREC and ALK inhibitors that are being used um, and there are also other drugs currently available uh, are being tried as second and third line therapy in differentiated thyroid cancer. I'll leave this up in terms of local uh, in Southern California resources, as well as um, national, international, the Southern California Thyroid Cancer Consortium and our website, as well as the ITOG uh, website. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful to everybody.